I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm also really glad there wasn't a whole lot of traffic on my drive down here because I got here without being totally frazzled. Um, as you can see from the change of the name of the uh, talk, we actually renamed GLASS to Fermi after Enrico Fermi just yesterday in our first light press conference, which we had teleconically uh, in, in the ether, as it were, um, sponsored by NASA headquarters. So these slides have, have the new logo and the new look and uh, also some of the new results. Okay, so let me first tell you about the Fermi mission. <coughs> it is the first space-based collaboration between astrophysicists and particle physicists. And that was sort of a challenge, actually. I've been working on this mission since 1992 when I went to Slack for my first sabbatical shortly after I became a professor at Cinema State. And so it's been a long haul, although not the record holder for satellites that I've worked on. Uh, we were very happy to have launched in June, June 11th, 2008. And right now we're just about to start our first year all-sky survey. That will be followed by uh, many years of competitive guest observer programs. The nominal lifetime of the mission is five years, with a goal lifetime of 10 years. So we'll be doing this for quite a long time. And besides the astrophysicists from NASA and the particle, whoops, the particle physicists from the Department of Energy, GLAST is a huge collaboration that involved over 300 scientists from many different countries, including France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Sweden, and lots of different institutions in the United States. We had the support of astrophysicists and particle physicists in a lot of those countries as well. Okay, so here is Fermi. I'm going to have to retrain myself to say Fermi because I just about said glass. Here's Fermi before launch. This is sitting in the clean room at General Dynamics who built the spacecraft. And the large area telescope is this big, I'm going to keep hitting the wrong thing, is this big box on the top. I don't think that works very good. Does this one work any better? No? Okay, well it's the big flat box on the top. And the glass burst monitor has 14 different detectors. You can see half of them on this side, the other half are on the other side. So there's three here, there's three here. Those are the low energy detectors. And then there's one here, and that's the higher energy detector. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about those um, as we go through this. And then you can see the people for, th for the scale of, of things. So the glass burst monitor, here's a close-up of the instruments, was, is led by Chip Meegan. He's the principal investigator. He's at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. And he worked with people from the University of Alabama Huntsville and also partners in Germany who really built most of the detectors in this secondary instrument um, that's on board the observatory. So this is the low energy detectors. There are 12 of them. Uh, they're made out of sodium iodide. So when the gamma rays come in to the sodium iodide crystals, they convert into visible light. And then we read out the visible light signals um, with the usual types of electronics in order to figure out what just happened. These start at the pretty much normal x-ray band of about 10 keV. So, th so for the people that are not scientists in the audience, that's about 10,000 times the energy of a visible light photon and go all the way up to about 1 million electron volts and are used to provide triggers uh, for the gamma ray bursts that are seen and crude locations. Then there are two of these higher energy detectors made out of bismuth germinate and they start at the higher energy x-ray end, about 150,000 electron volts, and go all the way up to 30 million electron volts overlapping with the lower energy range of the large area telescope. And that's the website that you can go to for more information, although all these are linked from the site that I'll show you later that's easier to remember. The Large Area Telescope, which is the thing that I've worked the most closely with, is led by Professor Peter Michelson from Stanford. And he was on this first flight telecon yesterday along with Chip. 
It's an international collaboration between NASA, the Department of Energy, a lot of other universities in the United States, including my own, and then institutions in France, Italy, Japan, and Sweden. It, the Large Area Telescope is a four by four array of towers. So here you can see the top of the thing. It looks like sort of a bunch of luggage. Each one of those is a tower. And each tower is a pair conversion telescope that has a calorimeter underneath. And the Large Area Telescope team has its main website at Stanford that's still called glass.stanford.edu, although probably within the next month or so, everything will be migrating to Fermi.whatever. So how does a pair conversion telescope work? Well, here's an animation. So we're uh, pretending that we're in space here and we're flying in the camera over the solar panels, which stick out very <coughs> far. And here's a cutaway view of one of the towers. And each tower has in it 19 different layers of detector material and the first 17 have converter material. So the gamma ray photon comes in and it goes through a few of the towers. It's that purple thing. Then it converts into a pair of an electron and a positron. Those particles then travel through the subsequent layers, leaving tracks of charge behind them that are read out by electronics. When they get down to the bottom, they get, the energy gets deposited in the, in the calorimeter, and the tracks that are left in the different layers are used to reconstruct the direction of the incoming gamma ray. And so using that technique, we can make crude images on the sky of what the gamma ray sources look like. Now, this is actually something that's a first. Um, Fermi is going to be the first gamma ray telescope that ever actually resolves a source up at these energies. Until now, everything has just sort of looked like point sources because we haven't had the resolution. But with gamma rays, you can't focus them with mirrors or lenses the way you do with visible light. We have to use these more exotic techniques that take into account the fact that Einstein's fam most famous equation, E equals mc squared, really matters. We're turning the E, the energy of the gamma ray, directly into the mass, the M, of the positron and the electron pair that then travel with the remaining E through the, down through the layers and deposit the energy in the calorimeter. Um, I'm going to, I have that on, on a subsequent slide, so if you could just wait for a second. Okay, so here's a, a more simple cutaway view um, showing again the the tracker with the different layers and the calorimeter down here, which wasn't shown on the previous animation. And um, the important thing to notice about this is that it also shows something that was left off in the animation, and that is the anti-coincidence detector shield that goes around the entire large area telescope. Because looking for gamma rays from the cosmos is really pretty much like looking for needles in haystacks. We get 100,000 cosmic rays and other things that we don't want that set off the detectors that we have to screen out before we can telemeter the information about the one gamma ray that we want down to the ground. And so the charged particles, the cosmic rays, will produce a signal in the anti-coincidence detectors. And if uh, then a signal is seen also in the tracker, we throw that one out. We don't use that data. We don't, throw, we don't send those data down to the ground. We only use the gamma ray photons that make it through because they're, they're neutral, they're light, they have no charge. They make it through the anti-coincidence detectors into the tracker, and then those are the signals that we keep. Um, the other thing I like to point out is that the silicon strips that are in the tracker, on each one of those layers there are strips that are oriented in, one in this direction and strips that are oriented in, in the perpendicular direction. So we get a two-dimensional readout where in each tower the track was, was laid down by the charge. And the same thing is true for the calorimeter down at the bottom. There's two, two different directions of orientation of the cesium iodide logs that are, um, that are down, as that's what hodoscopic means, that are down in the calorimeter. So when that, those particles uh, shower in the calorimeter, we can read out the location of that shower in two dimensions as well. And that gives us additional information that we can use to reconstruct the tracks. So here's some real hardware pictures. I've showed you some cartoons. Here's one tracker. The trackers were, for the most part, uh, built by the Italians. And here's uh, one calorimeter module. The calorimeter was, for the most part, built at Naval Research Lab in, near Washington, DC. And in, here's the 4x4 grid structure, so a tracker 
and a calorimeter module went into each one of these big s cubes or squares here. Here's the suitcase looking thing that I showed you before that shows the 16 towers. And then of course we had all the electronics that went along with each one of these trackers and then the anti-coincidence detector shield on top of the whole thing. That went into there as well. And then finally here is the integrated lap covered up with its thermal protecting blanket and its electromagnetic interference protecting blanket. And then they're putting the radiators on the side to get rid of the heat from all those electronics. We have to read all those electronics out all the time because of all those 100,000 cosmic ray particles that are sending out all these triggers that we want to throw out. So we need to have um, really a lot of electronics. And what's amazing is that all of this is basically being done with about as much power as in a, as in a, a hair dryer. So 1,500 watts for the entire thing. So that's some really wonderful electronics. The electronics were for the most part designed and built at UC Santa Cruz. And the anti-coincidence detectors were designed and built at Go NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. How often do you lose a real signal because the cosmic ray just happened to hit the detector? Hopefully not very often. Um, because we have the ability to read out at the microsecond level and there aren't all that many gamma rays. Okay, so here's our oblig obligatory launch picture. Um, from June 11, 2008, and I had the privilege to be one of the few people that was able to stick it out down in Florida for the extra week that it took um, to wait for the launch. There were probably 500 people down there the week that it didn't launch, but, but Pierre and, and Reggie and I <laughs> managed to stay for the uh, actual event that happened into the second week of our stay in Florida. Glass is very heavy, or Fermi is very heavy. Uh, the mass is about 4,300 kilograms, and so that took nine solid rocket boosters, which you can see some of around the bottom of the, of the Delta II rocket. And um, it's nice and safe up there, and it's 555 kilometers circular orbit, and we have about a 40 megabit per second downlink. And so there's uh, our little st former, former logo and sticker on the rocket, and that is the real, the real launch picture. It was really very exciting when it finally happened. So now we're in space, and so there we are in space, and there's our detectors. Um, we have GPS signals coming into the spacecraft. The spacecraft sends its data through TDRS, which is the tracking and data relay satellite system. Those signals go down to the ground. Then the signals um, from the ground station start off going to the Mission Operations Center, which is at NASA Goddard in Greenbelt, Maryland. Then the signals go to the Science Support Center at Goddard Space Flight Center also. But they also go to the Operations Center for the Large Area Telescope, which is just up the road a piece at SLAC, and to the Operations Center for the Glass Burst Monitor, which is in Huntsville, Alabama at Marshall Space Flight Center. So both instrument teams have support centers where they are able to look at the health and safety of the instruments and to um, change the software, change the way the things are being commanded, et cetera, depending on the conditions that they encounter in space. Because we have to uh, know exactly where we are, you know, over the Earth at any given time to be able to figure out, reconstruct the pointing and reconstruct the attitude of the satellite in space. It, it is, but if, and if you didn't have it, then it would certainly not be. So here's some of the very first data that even if we hadn't had our press conference yesterday, I would have been allowed to show you. This is the way the data look when they're analyzed by the Large Area Telescope team, or at least visualized by the Large Area Telescope team. I don't know if you can see the colors very well. So this is a single gamma ray event display. So here's a gamma ray uh, coming in and setting off setting off the, these layers of the tracker this one, in this one tower. And then it goes down into here and makes some little red places down here in the calorimeter so you can see where the energy is. And then they reconstruct the track of the gamma ray back up with this, with this yellow direction. In this one, which is even a little harder to see, there's actually two towers that have the tracks, this tower here and this tower here, of the incoming gamma ray. So that's basically how the reconstruction works, of course, with lots of computer software and algorithms and programming. 
Okay, so yesterday was our first light press conference when we unveiled the new name of Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, named after Enrico Fermi, who was a famous physicist from the University of Chicago um, once he emigrated to the U.S., built a nuclear reactor under the football stadium at the university, from what I understand, later worked on the Manhattan Project, um, won his Nobel Prize in 1938 for induced radioactivity. So he, he realized that you could make non-radioactive elements radioactive by blasting them with neutrons. And um, is also the, the one of the early fathers of the whole field of gamma ray astronomy. And so we thought it was very fitting. He's one of the top scientists of the 20th century. And Italian, and the Italians contributed a lot to uh, GLAST, uh, Fermi. And um, also there's a lot of connections with the Department of Energy, which helped a lot in funding the Large Area Telescope because they have a lab in near Chicago called Fermilab. So they were happy with the name as well. Okay, so now I'll show you some of the results from the first light press conference. This is the first month of bursts as seen by the glass burst monitor, which will probably have to be renamed to the gamma ray burst monitor. Um, they're seeing about one burst per day. In the background you see little fuzzy dots from all of the bursts seen in nine years from the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory between 1991 and the year 2000 when it was re-entered. And so it's seeing about one burst a day, which is just what we expect from something that has an all-sky monitor on it. So that's very exciting. We're happy to see that that's all working. All 14 detectors are working flawlessly. And here's a typical strong burst that they saw. Um, we have no bursts seen by both the Large Area Telescope and the Burst Monitor yet, but there have been several Burst Monitor bursts that were also seen by SWIFT, one of the other satellites that we support up at Sonoma State. And so this is a pretty typical gamma ray burst. Um, as the saying goes, when you've seen one gamma ray burst, you've seen one gamma ray burst because they all look really, really different. And so this is just one of them. This one happens to have lots of peaks and last about 50 seconds, but you can have bursts that have one peak and last two milliseconds. So they're all over the place, and that's, of course, something we've been trying to understand for many years now. Here is the first light sky map from the Large Area Telescope. This represents 95 hours of data and gets down to the sensitivity that the EGRID experiment on Compton had after about one year. So this is a map in galactic coordinates. So here's our plane of our galaxy across the middle. There's the center of the galaxy. When you look up here, you're looking out of the galaxy. When you look down here, you're looking out of the galaxy. We see our three favorite bright pulsar friends, the Crab and Vela, and the one that isn't too familiar to people that aren't gamma ray astronomers, named Gaminga, which is apparently Italian for it's not there. <laughs> Because when it was discovered um, back in the 1970s, there was no sign of any other object at any lower energy wavelength. So it was just this big blasting gamma ray source with no obvious X-ray visible light or radio counterpart. And so it's also in the constellation Gemini, and so that was a cute sort of inside Italian joke. Um, later much later, they found X-ray pulsations from Gaminga using ROSAT, very faint X-ray pulsations, and so we now know that it is a pulsar. But for a long time, it was a big mystery. Um, but it's still really, you know, one of the top four gamma ray sources in the sky. Now, you see that really the brightest, the brightest gamma ray source is our Milky Way galaxy. And that diffuse gamma ray emission is coming from those same cosmic rays we're trying to keep out of the tracker hitting the gas in our galaxy and making gamma rays. And so one of the challenges that you need the high uh, angular resolution of, of Fermi to be able to unravel is the sources in the plane of our galaxy because with all that background from the diffuse glow, it's really hard to pick out individual faint point sources. So having better angular resolution and better sensitivity really is going to help with that. Right, and so for the most part, these are extragalactic sources, and for the most part, they are all blazars. And that was one of the really big surprises in the Egret era, because before Egret, nobody really thought there would be all that much to study up at these really high energies. And then it turned out that pretty, 
that the vast majority of the sources that were identified with obvious objects were these active galaxies with jets that are pointing right at us. And the gamma rays are coming out aligned with the jets. And so the jets are variable, wildly variable. And when this map was made for these uh, 95 hours, this source was incredibly bright. And it was, it was flaring. And by the time they were done making this map, it had faded away. And a different source, a Parkes radio source, was the one that happened to be flaring. And so, as Peter Michelson said in yesterday's press conference, the gamma ray sky is sort of like the 4th of July with everything exploding all the time and all these fireworks going off, except they're going off in gamma rays. And you never know what galaxy is going to flare next or really where the next gamma ray burst is going to come from. Now, if this works, I'll be very happy. OK, so this is, we took that sky map and we put it on the globe. So we're super, superhumans outside the gal outside the entire universe looking back on the globe of our universe. And this is showing the North Galactic Pole. You can see a bunch of other blazars up here. Here's the plane. There's Gaminga and the Crab. As it comes around again, it's going to switch and show you the view with the South Galactic Pole and a few of the blazars that are down there. This is called an orthographic projection. It's just sort of a cool way to, to show the whole thing. Because um, when you show people the peeled apart version of the map and it's flat, it's sort of hard to visualize that it's sort of all around you. OK, that'll just keep going. Hopefully now it will stop. Woo, I went a little too fast. No, I didn't. OK. So the Vela Pulsar, that was one of the pulsars that I showed you. In just the first few days of, of regular routine science observations, the LAT detected all seven egret pulsars. And this one is the Vela Pulsar. It has a period of 89 milliseconds. And you can see it pulse on and off in the data, just you know, basically in, in the raw data. It's that bright. Those pulsars were what were seen by egret over the many years of its observations. And now we're poised to discover some new ones. OK, so here's the answer to the question that somebody asked me before um, about the angular resolution. So here's a comparison of Egret versus Fermi, large area telescope. One of the differences you can see right away is that the upper energy range of Egret was about a factor of 10 below the upper energy range of the LAT. The area between 30 GeV and 300 GeV is basically unexplored. This is all new territory. We don't really know anything about what the universe looks like at those energies. And so that's a, a something that's really going to be different that Fermi can do for us. Now, the ground-based telescopes that look at air showers basically start around 300 GeV, or maybe they can get down to 250 on a good day. So we are, our upper energy range basically overlaps with the lower energy range of the ground-based air shower and Shrenkov types of telescopes. Um, but the band between 30 and, and 300 GeV is basically unexplored. And so we're really excited to be able to be looking at the universe in this whole new energy range. As you can see, we also have a lot more square centimeters. And we're looking at a large part of the sky all at once, about over two star radians at any given time. That big, square, funny-looking telescope you can have gamma rays coming in the side, and we can detect them and reconstruct their paths just fine. They don't just have to come in the top like the ones that I showed you. And so we're seeing about a sixth of the sky at any given time. And that means that every three hours as we go around the Earth, every two orbits, we see the entire sky. So we are surveying the whole sky every three hours. If something flares up, a galaxy flares up, we're going to see that. In, you know, on a three on basically an hour type time scale. We don't have to wait a week to add up the data to see something that just flared. And probably the best angular resolution um, is for the very high energy photons, we can get down to, you know, a tenth of a degree or, or less. Also, of course, much more sensitive. Um, adding up, that's per photon, adding up a bunch of um, data on a particular source, we should be able to resolve things at a half an arc minute. OK, so that does allow you to actually make some crude images of extended sources and gamma rays. And of course, we hope for, for our goal lifetime of, of 10 years. That's just the, the, the five-year nominal lifetime. OK, so now I've shown you all the new data I can show you because everything else is still being worked on since we really just launched a couple months ago and we just finished the in-orbit checkout phase really only a couple weeks ago. 
Um, so now let me just talk to you about some hypothetical things that we hope to be learning as the data accumulate and as the years roll on. So some of the big, some of Egret's greatest hits basically were, as I mentioned before, the establishment of these blazars, these active galaxies with their jets pointing at us as the largest class of extragalactic emitters of high energy gamma rays. They saw many flares from blazars, some that were less than a day long. So flares that had time scales of hours. But because of the bad crude angular resolution that Egret had, more than 60% of the 270 sources that it saw are unidentified. We have no idea what they are. We cannot match them up with objects that, we're, that we can see at lower energy uh, bands. Egret did measure the extragalactic gamma ray background, but couldn't tell if it was truly diffuse or just a bunch of unresolved sources. Egret discovered gamma rays from four pulsars, and there were three that were known before, so that makes the seven that I mentioned earlier. Um, it also studied some cosmic rays and some solar flares and gamma ray bursts. Okay, so there's the Egret sky map above 100 MeV, adding up all the data from the entire mission. And it doesn't look a whole lot different than what I just showed you from glass for the first few days. Okay, so you see different bright blazars though, like you see 3C279 up there. Here's Velo, Gaminga, and the Crab again. And you see a few other, you see a few other um, extragalactic blazars. But that's basically, you know, this was the first generation instrument. So now we're, we're on to the next generation. Here's the catalog of sources from EGRIT. This is their third catalog, so this represents nine years of data. And you see the different objects are labeled with different uh, symbols. So here's the pulsars with the squares, um, an occasional solar flare. The blazars are the diamonds, active galactic nuclei. That's by far the most prolific type of source. About 70 of the 270 EGRIT sources are these blazars. And then all the green ones are the un unidentified ones. So that is work for Fermi to do. And we expect, with the Large Area Telescope, to see thousands of sources that we will be able to resolve and hopefully um, identify most of them. Here's just the, the log n log s curve that shows how many sources there should be at certain flux levels. Here's the egret threshold. And here's you know, one estimate that, that Fermi should be able to see 4,500 or so sources. Okay, so 170 of the 270 sources have no counterparts at longer wavelengths. And there, a lot of them are variable. Some of them are variable within the galactic plane. Some of them are variable outside the galactic plane. Those are probably blazars. Um, we're not sure. Some of them may be in our own galaxy. And there may be some sources that are near our galaxy, it's been suggested, that could be associated with the, the Gould's Belt, which is a star-forming region. That's just a suggestion. It hasn't really been confirmed by anybody, but it's a plausible anyway. So what could the unidentified sources be? Well, uh, we think a lot of them are like Gaminga. We think they're radio quiet pulsars. And Fermi, for the first time, will be able to do a direct search for pulsations. We have enough square centimeters to get enough photons to actually do Fourier transforms on data to be able to find pulsations. And that was impossible before, okay? We had Egret and other uh, earlier generation experiments had so few photons that you had to know the pulse period and then fold the data with the pulse period and then confirm that it was a, pulse par a pulsar. You couldn't do a blind search. And I'm sure people here are familiar with blind searches. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can do blind searches. We can find these pulsars. And so we expect this to be pretty much a given. We will find radio quiet pulsars, more gaminga like objects. Um, previously unknown blazars. Okay, so we'll be seeing flaring objects with good positions. We'll be able to go out with ground based telescopes and get those identifications and prove that those things are active galaxies. Um, the next three categories are more speculative. People have hypothesized that some binary systems that make X-rays, X-ray binaries in our galaxy, should actually be able to produce high energy gamma rays as well due to the shocking of the, of the winds as they accrete from the companion star onto the compact object. 
Uh, also, the microquasars, which is another form of uh, binary system, which is a rapidly rotating uh, stellar mass black hole that has jets. We should be able to, in some people's uh, theories, see the jets from the microquasars like we see the jets from the blazars if they're oriented at us correctly. And then there also have been predictions that clusters of galaxies um, should show some shocks that might be able to be energetic enough to be detected by the Fermi experiments. So we'll see. Um, we'll probably have press conferences about all these things <laughs> as we discover them. I'm looking forward to that part anyway. Uh, here's just an old, some very old data from 1996 during the Egret era, era showing a big flare from 3C279, which, w which during that time was the brightest blazer and flared a lot. And here's data from the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer. The key here is to get a lot of multi-wavelength data while these active galaxies are flaring in order to see whether all of the different energies go up at the same time, whether the lower energies go before the higher energies, whether the higher energies you know, go before the lower energies. The different models for how the jet emission works make different predictions about what should happen as a function of energy with these flares. And so having broadband coverage in many different wavelengths, not just the high energy gamma ray, is very important to being able to un understand how all of these jets should be getting shot out of these black holes when, of course, you know, conventional wisdom is that black holes are sucking in everything that gets too close. And so um, we, would, we don't even understand what kinds of particles are in the jets. We don't even know if they're negatively charged particles or positively charged particles. And if they're positive, are they protons or are they positrons? We don't even know the basic things like that about the jets. We do know that some kind of charged particles have to be getting accelerated in tremendously strong magnetic fields to make the jets in the first place, but we don't know anything more than that. So those are the things we'd like to study, um, how the jets, the particles get accelerated and how the emission processes work in the jets. We would like to know if regular garden variety radio galaxies can also be high energy gamma ray sources. And what about Seifert galaxies? What about the, the galaxies that have jets that you're not looking right down the jet? You know, what if you're looking from the side of the jet? If you have more sensitivity, do you get to see high energy gamma rays from these types of galaxies? We don't know the answer to that. Um, we don't know how the blazars evolve. We don't know whether there are more blazars or, or fewer blazars <coughs> as you look back in time. You need to have a statistically larger sample of these objects in order to answer those kinds of questions. 70 isn't going to do it. We would like to know if the extragalactic background is really diffuse or just made up of a bunch of blazars that we haven't been able to resolve. And the, the ener high energy spectra of these blazars uh, seem to show a cutoff at the higher energies. And we would like to know whether that cutoff is intrinsic to the source or just due to the fact that those high energy photons scatter off of lower energy light on their way here, making what's called the extragalactic background light or the EBL cutoff. And so we need to be able to look above the egret energy band to be able to answer that question and have a statistically large enough sample to be able to study it. OK, so what about supernovae and cosmic rays? Galactic cosmic rays are most likely accelerated in supernova remnant shocks. Uh, egret provided evidence of the, of the pion bump at 68 MeV, which showed that cosmic rays were being accelerated um, in situ and then turning into pions and then the pions were decaying and making 68 MeV gamma rays. And so there is some evidence that you have this type of interaction in the shocks, but there's also evidence that the cosmic ray production is variable depending on where you look. So for example, the large Magellanic cloud, you could see gamma rays from, but it couldn't see them from the small Magellanic cloud. You know, why? <laughs> we don't know. Um, some egret sources could be supernova remnants, but we couldn't really tell because we didn't have the angular resolution. Um, there have been X-ray observations and then TEV from, from the ground, basically, observations of one supernova remnant, SN1006, for example, that show that there are shocked electrons that could be accelerated to the energies that you need to make um, this type of, of pion uh, gamma rays later. So we would like to study those things. Um, for example, 
if you just see a source and the x-ray source is a really good position and here's the supernova shell and the egret makes this big mushy blob, can you tell whether the source is a pulsar in the middle or a shocked region where cosmic rays are making the high energy gamma rays? So Fermi will be able to, to resolve supernova remnants in at least six cases that we know about where the size of the supernova remnant is much larger than our point spread function. And so these will be really the first resolved gamma ray images th that will um, give us some really exciting science. So stand, stand by for those results in a little while. Um, we should also be able to see the pi n bump in this at 68 MeV in the supernova spectrum. And then studying the actual spectral components, learn things about electrons and nucleons and the cosmic rays, learn about the different kinds of cosmic rays, hopefully see the cosmic rays in other galaxies, not just in our own. And then also by looking at the cosmic ray uh, interaction with the gas in the hydrogen gas in our own Milky Way, learn more about the H2 distribution in our own galaxy. Okay, so one way of doing it, the normal way of doing it, is to look at radio data. But this is another way of doing it, um, is to study the gamma rays in the galactic plane and see how well that correlates with the radio maps. Okay, so here are those famous seven pulsars that Egret saw. And as you can see, um, they're not all visible in all the different wavelengths. So here's Gaminga, right? So there's nothing here in radio, nothing in optical, very faint in x-ray where the pulsations were finally discovered and then this whopping gamma ray source. This is it. You know, this until, until Fermi launched, this was the total number of pulsars that made gamma rays. And there are a lot of really interesting questions that we would like to answer about these rotating neutron stars. Um, we don't know which is the right way of looking at where the the jets and the pulsars come from. The polar cap model versus the outer gap model, for example. Two, two very well uh, constructed models that, that make very different predictions. Are the particles accelerated in a beam by the polar cap or are the particles accelerated right near the light cone? How is the particle beam energy converted into the gamma rays that we see? How many pulsars really are there that make gamma rays that are spinning down fa quickly? How, how how many pulsars are born and where is most of the energy coming out in the pulsar spectra? These are all questions that we hope to address with, with Fermi observations. We predict up to 250 pulsars should be visible rather than just the seven that we currently study. And half of them should be previously unknown in radio, just like Gaminga. So this would be a whole new population of pulsars that haven't been studied by anybody before. So that's very exciting. And this is just um, a prediction. Here's the pulsar period across the bottom and basically the spin down right um, along the side. And so this is um, early calculation of what the sensitivity limit should be. Here's the seven. And then there's a whole bunch more up here that we should be able to get to. And what's that prediction based on? Uh, based on the spin down right, basically. The, the, you know, how fast it's spinning down. So how much energy is available to be converted into the gamma rays. And um, another, so here, here for example is one way we might be able to tell the polar cap model from the outer gap model. They predict different high energy cutoffs in the pulsar spectra. And as you can see the egret data points go right to sort of in between the two models with big error bars. We should be able to do better than that, especially up at these high energies. Okay, so finally, <laughs> last but not least, um, searching for dark matter. So this is the thing that gets most of the press. Of course, it's also one of the more speculative things that we're going to try to do. And for those of you who are not familiar with um, some of the terminology, um, one of the most popular candidates for dark matter is an exotic particle, often called a WIMP, weakly interacting massive particle but to particle physicists called the lightest supersymmetric particle, um, especially if it's stable, okay? So if you have cold dark matter and you have a particle that's not a baryon, so it's not a normal particle like a proton or a neutron, and it's supersymmetric, the lightest one of those in certain varieties of supersymmetry, certain models, certain classes of models, um, also called a neutralino, 
because it's neutral, can be stable under certain situations. And, and so if you have all of those conditions holding, you could have this particle that people call a wimp. And um, wimps, wimps self-annihilate. So just like an electron can get together with the positron and annihilate and make two gamma rays of the energy 511 keV, 1,000 electron volts, that tells you the rest mass energy of each of those two particles. Those particles have opposite charge. They combine. The two m's combine. You make E. Okay. Well, WIMPs actually can self-annihilate. And there are two different channels for them to, to produce things when they do that. In one channel, you produce two gamma rays. And just like the positron and the electron, the energy of those two gamma rays gives you the rest mass energy of the WIMP. Or the other channel is it can make a Z boson and a, and a gamma ray. And so in either one of these cases, you would predict to see some gamma ray lines that would be characteristic of the energy of the WIMP. And amazingly enough, or not maybe so amazing because all the other things have been ruled out, the best predictions are in this unexplored band that Fermi can get to that wasn't seen by egret. Because, of course, if that line had been below 30 G, you know, GeV, then maybe egret could have seen it, or particle accelerators could have seen it. And in fact, the parameter space for where this wimp mass could be is shrinking. It's sort of being bounded on, on all sides by different experiments. And, and the Large Hadron Collider, which is firing up over in Switzerland at CERN, is trying to come at it from the particle physics point of view. And they're trying to detect the WIMP in direct collisions that they're going to be making in their accelerator. We'd like to see evidence for the WIMPs by studying the universe and letting nature be the accelerator. So here's just one of many, many, many predictions by people. Um, that shows that, that the WIMPs, because they're heavy, should sink to the galactic center and make a halo around the galactic center. So this is still galactic coordinates. There's the center of the galaxy. Showing that under this particular scenario that these people calculated, you should be able to, in, with two years of data from Fermi, see w evidence for WIMPs by looking at a concentration near the center of our galaxy. But I should caution you that there are many, many versions of the WIMP models. There are many, many versions of the supersymmetric models. People run whole classes of models, and, and only some fraction produce WIMPs with the right cross sections and the right energies to be able to be seen to make these kinds of lines th that we would see. And then you have to say things about how they're going to clump and how they'd be distributed. And so there's lots and lots of hand waving that's going to go on. Nevertheless, we're searching for it. And um, it's fun to be in a race with CERN. And uh, may the best group get the Nobel Prizes in the end, if <laughs> it turns out to be true. Well, here we are. Um, I'm doing good on time. I'm right where I should be, leaving time for questions. We are here. We have just started our first year of Sky Survey. And the first year of Sky Survey data belong to the team. But there's a limited guest observer program going on in cycle one for people to do uh, correlated observations and correlated theory. And so we welcome people to apply to cycle two for guest observer money. Um, also to get involved in ground-based monitoring with small telescopes, watching the big active galaxies uh, to flare. My own group at Sonoma State has a little telescope that we do with, um, use with high school students and college students to monitor these active galaxies for flaring. But you can also use, of course, bigger telescopes if you're a professional and um, apply for time in cycle two to be part of these teams that are doing the multi-wavelength monitoring or modeling of the stuff that we do if you're a theorist. Um, we're going to be releasing all the gamma ray bursts. They're already going into the galactic uh, gamma ray burst coordinates network. That's already started to happen. We're already issuing astronomers telegrams when the galaxies flare. So the information is starting to come out now that we're out of our checkout phase which I do have to say is the smoothest checkout phase I have ever personally gone through. It was just amazing how well everything went. Um, from once we finally got launched, everything has just been a piece of cake since then. <laughs> so that's really wonderful to see that the hard work of all these hundreds of people all over the, the world have paid off at long last. And um, after the, f the sky survey is over, after the first 12 months, then for the most part, the rest of the mission will be dominated by guest observer programs. But because of the large area of uh, telescopes, huge field of view, 
it, you have to think about it a little differently. You're not just going to point the telescope somewhere that doesn't really make sense. You're still seeing a sixth of the sky. So people are being encouraged to think about you know, science that you can do rather than places you can point. Um, that's more or less the thrust of, of the Guest Observer Program. Because there's going to be a lot of stuff in the field of view anytime you're looking. And you're going to be able to do your science but not necessarily claim every object in your field of view. It's a little tricky to figure out how to do that and we fought over it for a lot of years. But I think we finally have a good solution. And we'll be releasing the, the first uh, catalog of sky sources, of course, at the end of that sky survey at the end of the first year. So that brings me to my conclusions, which I think, I hope I've convinced you that in just a, fir a few days of analyzed data, we have, have reached our nominal sensitivities and we're starting to discover new sources of things in the high energy gamma ray sky. We are poised to open a, a wide new window, especially at the higher energies on the universe. Um, showing us, with any luck, the connections between the infinite scale of these really large objects that we're studying and the really tiny things, like maybe particle dark matter. So stay tuned. Uh, the best is yet to come. And all of, the, all of the websites I mentioned and all of the data that I've shown you can be seen from the sort of the main website, which is www.nasa.gov slash GLAST, soon to be renamed to <laughs> www.nasa.gov slash Fermi. And uh, that's it. So thank you very much, and I'll do questions. Since we've touched it, we'll use the microphone just because it helps with the recording. So just raise your hand and I'll bring it. So, so given that you can't actually point the telescope to anything. Oh, you can point it. We just, it's, just, it's just sort of a waste of time. OK, to but do it. so you don't want to po <laughs> point it anywhere, right? And given that. The vast majority of the data is being made publicly available. What exactly does a guest observer do other than data mine the existing data that is made available to anybody anyway? The, the data are, are being made public in terms of the gamma ray bursts that we see and in terms of the um, you know, results like flaring or non flaring. So, yes, you, you data mine the data, but of course, if you get a guest as a grant, you get money to do the data mining. So, that's always a good thing, okay. especially if you're not from the Department of Energy. So, somebody who's sitting at home who just felt like data mining, like they do with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey all the time, right. actually could do they, real they science using the data that you're releasing. They just wouldn't have they any money they to do they it. They could probably sometime in the second year once the tools are released to the public, but. Um, it's not that easy as looking at visible light data, as you can see from having to reconstruct tracks. And, you know, there's a lot of subtleties that go on. And so um, that's why we have the Science Support Center at NASA Goddard, is to help people understand how to analyze this kind of data. It's not, not quite so easy. This is a ringer here. This is Jeff Scargill. He's a member of the Large Area Telescope <laughs> team. He's going to ask me some hard question. Um, no, I'm just going to take you to task for leaving out my favorite um, thing, or not. There's an, an exotic physics thing that apparently is considered even more exotic than dark matter, I guess, or more unlikely, namely a quantum gravity thing where there, a glass could possibly detect a, a small dispersion in, due to the lumpiness of space-time in, in gamma ray burst um, light curves. And it, it is. Um, it's a stretch, but I, I personally think it's more likely to yield fruit than, than dark matter, but th that's my opinion. Okay. Anyway, thanks P for this. People really have nice looked for the survey. quantum gravity effect in uh, burst data with SWIFT and other satellites that have been studying gamma ray bursts and haven't seen it yet, but it is possible because of the incredibly large energy range between the GBM and the higher energies of, of the LAT that you might be able to see the effect better because it's just so many orders of magnitude difference in the photon energies. Just as an EPO thing, I think that should be included. It should be a lot of no, it, it, It's there. It's OK, there. Jeff, I'll put it in my next talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you sort of implied this, but um, can you see blazars at cosmological distances? How far away? Yes. Uh, all the way. I mean, any of them that happen to be pointing at us. So the question is, how far back do they really go where th they're blazars, right? So that's what we'd like to know. Right, so, you know, we're not, we're not limited by anything. We certainly have the sensitivity to see the earliest blazars wherever they may be.
Uh, you implied there's a. Uh, uh, let me just. The one that I showed you on the map that was flaring, that was at 7 billion light years. Yeah, the 3C454, that, and that's just one random one that happens to be flaring right now. You implied there's a gap in uh, the energy that can be absorbed between 30 GeV to. 300 GeV? 300 GeV. Uh, what is putting the cap on the top uh, of oh, the energy? Um, basically, how much cesium iodide we could afford to fly because the stuff is really heavy. So the heavier the spacecraft, the harder it is to launch, and that already took all nine rocket boosters to get it up there. Right? So in order to stop higher energy gamma rays, you have to have even more heavy stuff to convert the gamma rays and to capture the energy. So that's where the high energy limit comes from. Right, but there also another um, part in your talk where you said that in the, the dark matter right now is still being uh, bounded by uh, different energy levels. And there's a, uh, was it the three oh, T that was Oh, that was a TEV mm -hmm. limit coming down from the top yes. um, on the dark matter. And I, I believe that is, um, do you, know, do you know where that one comes from, Jeff, offhand? Well, it's, probably it's, it's, probably ground, it's probably a ground-based you know, TEV telescope of some sort. Um, but I, I'd have to check into that more. And the lower energy limit comes from current generations of accelerators and previous generations of gamma ray experiments in space.